ourselves trying to open up the door that was open before, but closed by the people who have granted access. And then the struggle continues. So either we replicate that dangerous cycle, or we decide to do something different in this generation, in this season, in this historical moment, because we have a tremendous opportunity. I tell people we stand, I think, at the threshold of, yes, in some people's eyes, a dangerous time, a destructive time, a chaotic time. But in times of chaos and distress and even destruction, there's always opportunity for something powerful to take place. A new infusion of hope and possibility. The only way that's going to happen is for those in this generation to take hold of that. To not try to wrestle the baton away, but create new ways to understand what the baton looks like. New mechanisms of how to create opportunities for those who are around us, who will come behind us, and not be excited because we walk in the door, but become more excited because the door stays open for the opportunities of so many. That is the challenge, I think, in this historical moment, that we have the opportunity to write a new narrative, not only in this community, but in this country. A new opportunity to write new narratives, create new stories, to awaken new dreams, to give rise to new hopes, and to make other people believe that you stand as a testimony to what is possible. But you can't stand as a testimony to what is possible unless you have a passion for what is possible. Not just a passion for personal gain, but a passion for what is possible for everybody, for those who come behind. Or else we have wasted another opportunity. We have wasted another moment. We have wasted our energies. And so, as a church, as a pastor, I find myself, and I believe myself, to be part, not only of that kind of community, but to be part of that mission to awaken and arouse the passion, to awaken and arouse the dreams of our community, to awaken and arouse the stories the stories that lead to transformation. And I think that it's possible for everyone, no matter what your background, as an educator, corporate, law, it doesn't matter. You always have an opportunity to foster a new paradigm of possibility, a new narrative of hope in your field so that other lives may be better for it. If you think about where you are right now, you think about how you've gotten to that place right now. The issue is, what path will you create for someone else? I don't want to believe that all of our energies and all of our resources and all of our gifts are for the sole purpose of personal gain. I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that somehow all the gifts that you've been given, all the opportunities that you have, all the blessings that have come your way, have come your way so that somehow you can be part of something bigger, to reshape something bigger, to create something bigger, and to broaden the possibilities for more people. I come from a background of Smith on Long Island town called Roosevelt. I don't know if many of you know about Roosevelt, I heard about Roosevelt. But when I came up to Roosevelt, it was uh, a problematic town for the most part. When people think of Long Island, they think suburbs. When you think of Roosevelt, you think suburbs. You call them danger in many ways, because it was a dangerous place in the late 70s and 80s to be in. That was the community I came out of. In fact, when I was in school, it was about the state to go to the school district because it was that bad. And I had a father who was an educator, but I chose to do my own thing. I was one of those young people who constantly were told that my possibilities were limited. I transferred from Roosevelt and I had to go to another school district because of my issues, right? And there, Graduating from high school, I was told that I needed to go to the military because I was not college material. A series of events took place. A particular gentleman invested in me for four years and not let me go, even though I was part of the problem of abilities. I will have undermined all that was invested in me because what was done for me was not just for me. And I was not just the benefactor of that counselor. All of those who have been come across the work that God has done in that place, in that church, are the benefactors of one man's investment and in a young kid that he refused to believe the streets could have. That's what it takes. Sometimes we get so intimidated by the daunting tasks, but forget that every community is transformed one block at a time. Every block is transformed 
one home at a time. Every home is transformed one person at a time. That's the investment we make. The investment we all can make. To transform not only our community, but our country for the better. We know the statistics. Unemployment is up. Homelessness is up. Poverty is up. In the midst of those kind of social crises, we have issues like what we confronted the past few days, I was talking to Mr. Lynch about with the death penalty, all kinds of issues that are confronting us right now in this historical moment. How will we answer? What will we say? What will be our contribution? Well, they say it was another generation that benefited but did not transfer the benefits. Or will we begin to look and become a different generation? that not only got the opportunities, but paved a new way, created new paradigms of possibility for those who came behind. I'm gonna pause right there. I'm just wondering what maybe you could say about how each of us helps to you know, carry on time. Like, you know, people always talk about mentorship and uh, you know, giving back, but are there other ways that you can see, you know, aside from maybe I'm big on is that I, I think that individually we all have that capacity, right, as you said, to mentor, to make that investment. But what happens is, is individually we feel as though that we're the only ones engaged in this kind of work. And we've lost the notion of collaboration. So that we've lost the idea that we can come together and have a greater impact. So whereas you and your lady, this young lady and her lady, this gentleman here, can all come together and try to find ways how we galvanize what we do to impact a larger number of people. Now, here's the problem. To galvanize a diverse group of people means from the very beginning that egos cannot be involved. Because once the egos get involved, we lose sight of the common agenda. Once personal gain gets on the table, how can I benefit? We lose sight of the agenda. So yes, it is easy to make that investment. But making an investment individually is not about setting up a structure to guarantee, right, the longevity of the mentor, the longevity of the engagement. And I think that was part of the flaw, part of the flaw of a few generations before us, that we became so enamored by the access, we did not seek to create mechanisms to guarantee that what we do, that this struggle, that this work would not fade. We became personality-driven movements, and we lost sight of how to galvanize around ideas and hopes rather than people and images. Beautiful example, we always talk about the civil rights movement. When King died, look at the chaos that ensued after that. You all of a sudden had a massive jockeying for a position, and in the process, the movement fades because personalities that may not have been equipped wanted to be at the forefront, and the movement dies. Now, the king was on his way to the poor people's campaign. He was making a critical shift in this country, which I think is the greatest shift you can make, that it is one thing to be a voice for civil rights for African Americans. It's another thing to shift to human rights and economic injustice. When you make that shift to human rights and economic injustice, you become a greater threat. As long as your vision of redemption and transformation is parochial, you don't always pose a threat. I say parochial because as long as the work is limited within a particular community, even though you become a nuisance, it's still manageable. So that the removal of signs, colored only, sitting when you want, still does not guarantee equity. It guarantees access, but not equity. You understand? And so if you now become, you get together, we say we want to form programs. We have to have some kind of structure and infrastructure to maintain the life of these ideas so that they do not fade because if they're personality driven, people driven, then what happens? When you fade from the scene, it fades. When I fade from the scene, it fades. And unless we have the capacity to create a structure that guarantees a cycle of persons beyond us, another generation beyond us, we will have what we have right now. People from this generation complaining that those before us do not give us opportunities. They fight against it. 
They do not shape us. They have not mentored us. They have not sought to develop us. And then you get that kind of empire. And it is as if we're starting and recreating the wheel all over again. And that gets frustrating. And I think that's a child. How powerful. Because of what, what they represent, but because of what they can birth. You see, what they can birth. And we know what the issues are. We know what the challenges are. We also know what the work is. The issue is, who's going to help ignite the pooling of those resources so we can deal with these issues? And I applaud Mr. Lynch and BLA for, for trying to begin that process. So I thank them for this opportunity. Thank you. 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 Thank you.